Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I took uh, Rich's suggestion to, uh, to give a talk that would give an overview. And uh, so this, this is uh, joint work with uh, Jamie Robbins, who will be speaking a little bit later, Robin Evans and uh, Ilya Spitzer. And um, I'm going to give an overview of three uh, slightly different approaches to formulating uh, causal models. The first being using potential outcomes. The second, non-parametric structural equations, which uh, um, Judea has, has just uh, described to us, and the third being graphs. And the, part of the reason why I, I bother to lay out these three different approaches is that uh, I've become aware that there are, there's a very large literature that applies causal models in econometrics and, and uh, in, in parts of biostatistics that's based on uh, potential outcomes. There's another literature in econometrics that uses uh, non-parametric structural equations. And then uh, there's a literature, a growing literature that uses graphs. And uh, I'm sometimes, um, uh, as, as uh, you know, also said, there are uh, sort of islands of resistance. And I think um, I wanted to try to describe First, to provide a simple translation between these different uh, frameworks for people that are familiar with some, maybe one but not the others, and also to, um, to maybe make clear why it is that some of the, uh, w why some of the resistance is there, because we'll see that all of these approaches have uh, certain blind spots. So these are not things that it's impossible to address, but, uh, but they are, um, each, each has its own strengths and weaknesses. Okay, um, yeah, I should also, and, I, and then I'll present some slight uh, extensions on, on uh, joining these frameworks together um, uh, that, that, are, that, are, that are novel. And I should add, uh, I think, sort of following the sequence of talks, we, we maybe had a talk that related to big data, and we had a talk that related to causality, and uh, I'm not going to manage to get causality and big data. There will be causality and some data, but it will not be, uh, will, will not be big data in this talk. I can't do everything in 40 minutes. Um, okay, so all, all causal models at a very high level, uh, 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 this may be sort of so obvious it doesn't need to be stated, but um, uh, relate two types of situation. An observational world, where there's some natural process that assigns treatment. For, for example, it could be each patient chooses their own treatment, or maybe their doctor chooses treatment for them. And an experimental world, and to keep things simple, I'm just going to c consider experimental worlds where, uh, where, for example, everyone is given the same treatment. So all of the, all of the uh, uh, causal models I'll talk about have these two, two different scenarios that are being considered. And we then have basic inferential tasks, which uh, already were um, covered, sort of discussed in uh, Judea's talk. For example, given some observational data and the causal model, we might wish to make predictions about what would be observed in a particular experimental setting. This is sort of the simplest task. Um, uh, uh, we, we might also have data from, um, from experiments and wish to work out what will happen if we then uh, if, if a treatment is adopted in some, uh, in some population where some people would choose to take it and others won't. And there are obviously elaborations on these where we combine um, experimental and observational data in, in various different ways and the, the extrapolation problems that Judea was talking about also fall into this category. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the harder problem of trying to work out what from, uh, from observational data, which causal model to apply. Uh, uh, there are talks, that, uh, that's a problem I've worked on, and, and there will be talks later on in this, uh, but, uh, but again, I can't cover everything here. So first I'm going to tell you about the potential outcome or counterfactual approach to formulating a causal model. So this has a long history, it goes back to, uh, goes back to David Hume, but sort of in statistics it goes to uh, Neyman in his uh, um, master's thesis in Polish, where he's talking about um, agricultural experiments, and he says, he's, he's, uh, so we have a field trial with the field chopped up into to portions of, um, uh, into, into slots, 
And um, we want to compare these V varieties on these uh, plots. And Neyman says, let's think about this as, as there being a matrix of numbers, a matrix uh, with, uh, in, in Neyman's notation, columns corresponding to plots and rows corresponding to varieties. And conceptually, we have this matrix, but of course, um, and, and the UIJ entry is the crop yield that would be observed if variety I were planted in plot J. Okay. But um, we have physical constraints. We can only plant one variety in a given, um, in a given plot. So consequently, uh, we're only ever going to get to observe one number in each uh, column. If we decide to plant variety one, in, um, in, in uh, plot one, we get to observe this number. If we plant the Vth variety, we get to observe this number, and so on. Okay. So now I'm going to simplify matters and, and turn it into a more medical setting. So we'll consider a binary treatment. Instead of V varieties, we'll just have two. Uh, taking value zero and one, zero being placebo and one being drug. And we're now going to, instead of thinking of a matrix of numbers, we're now going to think about two different variables. Y of x equals zero is the value, is the outcome that would be observed for a given unit if they were assigned to placebo. Uh, y of x equals one, conversely, for drug. And just, uh, these are two different random variables that uh, they're not realizations of the same variable. The, the, this notation might initially make you think that if you're a probabilist, but these are just two different random variables. And also, to keep things short, I'm going to use y of x sub i as a, as a shorthand for this. Okay. So uh, Rubin, in, in uh, 1974, wrote a very uh, influential paper that applied this to observational data. And so uh, this is sometimes called the, the name and Rubin causal model. Um, so a quick word to be mentioned here. This might look as if I'd made no, no assumptions at all. But of course, uh, we're assuming that these are well defined. And that, that means that we're supposing, in particular, that, uh, that it's enough to know that you've got um, the drug. There aren't sort of uh, five different ways that you could get the drug or five different uh, uh, you know, varieties of the drug. And we're also supposing that uh, a subject's outcome only depends on what they receive. So we're supposing no interference between, uh, between units. This, uh, Ruben, came up with this acronym of SUTBA to, to, to encapsulate these um, assumptions. So the kind of context where this would fail is something like a vaccine trial for an infectious disease where you know, if I'm not vaccinated but everybody else that I know is vaccinated, then uh, my outcome might be different from if, if myself and nobody else is vaccinated. And I think uh, Cosmo Shalisi will be talking a little bit about uh, um, causal inference in context where, where this assumption uh, doesn't hold. OK, so once we've got this set up, once we regard these variables as being well-defined, we can then think about, uh, we, we can then think of our, our patients as being of one of four types, never recover, patients who have a bad outcome, regardless of whether they get treatment or not. Those who are helped are those that w w will have a bad outcome if, uh, if they get placebo, and a good outcome if they get treatment, and so on. OK, so just to be clear, our potential outcome framework so far, I've told you about these potential outcomes. So uh, a way to think about this is that these potential outcomes describe the uh, experimental worlds. So this column describes the world where people, uh, everyone receives placebo. This column describes the world where everyone receives uh, treatment. Of course, we generally do not get to observe uh, um, both of these columns. That was name and setup. But we, but, uh, Having set up our experimental worlds, the causal model then links these to the observational world. And so here now, suppose that we have now assigned these patients, uh, you know, I'm not specifying how, but suppose these patients have now been assigned to treatment or control. We can then uh, generate their observed Y outcomes in the, in the sort of obvious way you would imagine. So this first patient was assigned to, uh, to, to drugs. So therefore, we looked over to this column that determines their observed outcome. Okay. So we could write this as just saying that the observed outcome y is just given by this simple uh, expression, just saying that uh, it's the placebo, uh, the, the counterfactual outcome under placebo, potential outcome under placebo of x is zero, and otherwise the potential outcome under treatment, which we could also just write in this way, or even more simply, we could just, uh, we could just substitute 
the actual value of x into, uh, into y in this way. So uh, under this framework, we've got the experimental world as primitive, and then we're deriving the observed world from it. Of course, in reality, we, uh, the fundamental problem of causal inference is we don't get to observe both of these, and so we have all of these question marks. So we, we uh, you know, the first patient was assigned to treatment. We get to see this outcome. We don't get to see this outcome. So all that we know about this per person is that they're either helped or they are of type always recovered, depending on whether this is a zero or a one. Okay, so a natural thing to be interested in is the average causal effect uh, being the difference between the uh, average outcome if everyone were treated uh, minus that if everyone received control. And in this simple setup, that would be the same as the difference between the proportion helped and hurt. Okay. Um, so, so now suppose that uh, X was assigned randomly in, in the observational world. so that x is independent, y is independent of uh, each of the potential outcomes. Then uh, we'll then, we, we then get, just by the independence, we get this uh, simple equality. And then by, by the way that the uh, counterfactual, the, the potential outcomes and the observed data are linked, we then get uh, that this will be equal to this. Um, this is just, this is just uh, the probabilistic version of what we saw it, it, where we, we got the observed outcome was equal to the potential outcome based on what treatment you got. Sometimes this is called consistency. Okay. So what we've now seen is that uh, we've now got another relation between the um, experimental worlds and the, and the obs uh, uh, observed world. This, this quantity we can observe in our um, observational world. This quantity over here is a contrast between two different, um, two different experimental worlds. And so we've seen that if, we, if these independences hold, then this quantity is identified. We could think a little bit more about this. So here's a, a, a very simple numerical example, a two-way table. Uh, so we could say, we could think about these four proportions that we have, the four types, helped, hurt, always recover, and never recover. All those possible distributions obviously live in a, a three-dimensional simplex. And given this particular observed data, we will then get this, this little line segment describing a set of possible distributions that we could get. So that even though we can't identify the, uh, the, the distribution over the potential outcomes, all of those distributions have exactly the same um, uh, value of the average causal effect. The average causal effect is identified even though things like the proportion helped can merely be bounded. Okay, so suppose let's now drop randomization. So if we drop randomization, we then get these bounds. We get very simple bounds on the average causal effect. And this is a sort of good news, bad news story. So the good news is that we can learn something about the average causal effect from, uh, from our observed data. But the bad news is that these bounds are always going to include 0, because they're always going to have width 1. We could think about this a little more. And uh, we could ask, what's the set of possible distributions that we could get? And the set of possible distributions turns out to be this uh, little polytope here. Um, and uh, using that polytope, we could then, we could then get bounds on, on any of these quantities if we happen to be interested. Again, we, we've got these rather, uh, rather boring bounds that are going to have widths 1 for the average causal effect. And we could, again, just looking at this picture, if we just, uh, to see how that relates to these bounds, we could just look at this picture from underneath. And then we'll see, if we look at, look at this plot directly from underneath, then we'll only see the helped and hurt axes. And we'll then get, uh, we can then read off these bounds directly. So we might say to ourselves, well, that's very nice. You know, it's nice to see this little picture here. But how does this actually help us? It turns out to be helpful because we can imagine a circumstance where, say, there's something that we, although, uh, although we didn't, we are unfortunately didn't randomize the treatment that we're interested in, we did randomize something else. And that other thing that we randomized might affect how likely patients were to choose treatment or to end up getting treatment, but not uh, influence the way in which they respond to treatment. And in that case, we would have basically two observational studies. And so here, I've, this is uh, data from Pearl's book, or originally from Efron, that, uh, uh, where Z is uh, 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 
denotes the treatment arm or the control arm, and then X denotes uh, compliance, which uh, Pearl dichotomized. So here, this is, a, a, again, another little data set. But we can think about this conceptually as being two different observational studies. We've got one observational study for Z equals 0 and another observational study for Z equals 1. Okay. So given what we just went through, looking at these, uh, these polytopes, we could, uh, and I should add, the reason we have these two zeros is because, uh, because nobody in the, although people in the, in the treatment arm might, have, might, not, uh, might decline to actually take the, treat, the pills that they're being given, nobody in the control arm has access to the pills. So the idea is we could analyze each Z arm as an observational study. And if we do that, here we now have two of these plots, one for the Z equals 0 arm and one for the Z equals 1 arm. And uh, this one is two-dimensional precisely because of we had those two zeros. And here we have this three-dimensional one. Well, under our assumption, which is that, uh, that which arm you're assigned to influence your, your uh, change the probability that, that a patient uh, was going to, um, to, to get treatment, but didn't change the, the way that that treatment affected their final outcome, then uh, our overall population has the same proportions of always recover, help, hurt, uh, and never recover in these two arms. So the obvious natural thing we can do is to take the intersection of these two. And if we take the intersection of these two, uh, two um, sets, we then get this little uh, red, red uh, shape over here. And now we have a good news story. Because if we look at this from underneath, we see that we've got bounds, and those bounds uh, bound us away from, from zero. So this is not, this is here, this is a, a, a this is, these are all bounds derived by, um, uh, derived by Volke and Pearl. Um, and I'll leave, leave for you to think about, uh, it sort of, it comes after a while, but initially it seems a little counterintuitive that the data from each arm give us bounds that include zero, but then when we, when we take the intersection uh, and then take the projection, we then get bounds that don't include zero. If you think about this geometrically, it sort of becomes obvious why that's the case. OK, so notice, what did we assume? We, didn't get, there's not, we don't get anything for nothing. We assume that the Z arm you're in doesn't affect your outcome Y except via X. So we're assuming Z has no direct effect on Y except through X. And we also assume that Z is randomized. Okay, so uh, just a, a little bit of uh, earlier literature. Robbins and Mansky derived bounds uh, for this kind of problem where Z was randomized. The initial bounds were not, in general, sharp. Volke and Pearl then uh, were the first to derive uh, closed form sharp uh, bounds for this problem via computational algebra. An advantage of the way that we, we're attacking the problem is that it, uh, the way I presented it to you is it wouldn't matter how many Z arms I have um, uh, as long as X and Y are both binary, I can put them all together, and uh, I get this, uh, uh, we get this, this expression that gives us the bounds. So this works for a setting where Z has, has many levels, and X and Y are, are both binary. And, and uh, this result uses the fact that, uh, that the, the um, Meyerson distributions for uh, under placebo and treatment are variation independent. OK, and th there are other examples where these designs can be used. So, so for example, encouragement designs, where we're encouraging someone to, to take a treatment, um, or an educational intervention where, say, we're providing um, uh, vouchers that allow someone to, to uh, people are randomly assigned vouchers that, that if they use them, provide um, them access to optional tutoring. And then X is whether they actually um, uh, 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 attend the, the optional tutoring and so on. Okay, so that's one approach. So we've seen one approach if, uh, if, X, if we're interested in, in, in getting a causal effect between X and Y and Z is, is, uh, and X is not randomized, we could get an instrument. Another approach is that we might find uh, a covariate L or maybe a set of covariates such that we can think about treatment as being randomly assigned condition on L. Okay? And so in the counterfactual literature, this is often written in this way, sometimes called conditional ignorability. So the idea is that conditional on L, um, uh, treatment is independent of the potential outcome. So you, you can sort of, ideally, you can think about this as the doctor is flipping a coin to assign treatment, but which coin they flip depends on your particular value of the covariate, which the, which the doctor knows. OK, and using that, we then get, um, we then get that uh, we can then find out the, um, 
the, uh, the distribution of the potential outcome conditional on L, and we can then average over, uh, over L using the minor distribution of L, this formula sometimes known as the backdoor formula or, or standardization. Okay, and I, I mentioned this, the point I just want to, to emphasize here is we made this assumption and that we then, uh, we then were able to uh, get the effect of X on Y via this, via this formula. Okay, so here's my summary of the, the potential outcome framework. Sort of if you've never seen this before, the, the take home message is this reduces causation to missing data. But uh, there are some caveats here, and there are because the, the missing data has a very particular structure. And so uh, we have to be cautious in, in, uh, in, in, um, in doing a statistical analysis. I don't have time to go into all the details of that, but, uh, but basically, um, conceptually, it's very simple. We've reduced causation to missing data. Or as I sometimes say, causation is something that many people are excited about. Missing data is something that statisticians, some statisticians are excited about, but not so many. So this represents conceptual progress when we've taken something exciting and reduced it to something that fewer people are excited about. <laughs> okay, so structural equation models. This is a second approach that uh, was also described by um, Judea in his talk. Um, so and this originates in, in econometrics, and I think the clearest uh, statement of the, of the, um, the way that uh, interventions are modeled is, is in the paper of Stroetz and Wald. The basic idea is that we have a system, a system of equations describing the observational world, one equation for each variable expressing that variable as a function of its direct causes in a disturbance term. So here, thinking back to the setup where I had uh, where x where L was a covariate, X was treatment that was assigned as a function of L, and then Y is your outcome that's, uh, that is um, a function of L and X. Okay? And so, again, notice, uh, so, so then, um, and I should add, often uh, that the models that uh, people using these models often assume that we have independent areas. Okay? So, um, so here, uh, I'll use the acronym NPSEM IE to indicate that, uh, that, that we're adding this assumption of the, uh, the areas being um, independent. Okay. So this describes the obs uh, observational world. We then derive experimental worlds from it by uh, 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 crossing out the equation for the variable that's being intervened on. Okay. So again, this was described in Yuta's talk. Here, x is being crossed out, and we replace it with x equals 0. We could also fix L to zero. Here's the, here's the setup for fixing L to zero. So th that was a very quick, I went into that in less detail, but basically the high level summary is that structural equation approach relates the observational and experimental scenarios by removing equations. Okay? As, as uh, Judea said, uh, this set of equations gives us all of the counterfactuals. We can intervene on any variable we want to, we just cross out the equation, and then that gives us a new system of equations and a new distribution. Okay. Then there's a graphical approach, and the graphical approach here, I'm, uh, the graphical approach takes a graph and associates with that a factorization. And um, if the graph has missing edges, this one doesn't, but if the graph has missing edges, then as described in uh, Judea's talk, um, the deseparation criterion can be applied to read off conditional independence that follows from this factorization. And then, um, then the uh, experimental world, again, as with the structural equation model, is then obtained from the observational one by removing edges into X and also crossing out the term for X in the factorization. So here, if here's my uh, uh, experimental world where I set x to zero, I can, uh, I can then uh, can get this distribution by taking a term for L, the term for Y given x equals zero in L, and setting it, uh, conditioning on x equals zero here, and just crossing out the term for x given L. Notice we could also apply the same operation to L here again. Okay, so now I've described, uh, so the graphical approach Okay, and I'm giving you a very rapid uh, description of this. We just uh, relate these two, two uh, situations by removing edges in the graph and removing a term in the associated factorization. 
And so the obvious question here is how do these uh, different structures relate? There are people that are sort of definitely partisan in one approach or, or another. So how do they relate and are they the same? Okay. And we'll see in certain respects we can, we can go from one uh, to, to the other, but there are some subtleties, and those subtleties are some of the reasons why, uh, wh why there are these differences. So the simplest thing is that given a non-parametric structural equation model with independent areas, then this, this is a result that was mentioned in the last talk, so I'll just uh, skip over it. Basically, we can very quickly construct a causal DAG by just writing the graph where each variable is, has edges directed into it based on its inputs in the structural equation model. And the distribution of the, the, uh, the, the observational distribution then will factor according to the original DAG, so we can apply D separation. And if we, if we do an intervention, then the distribution of the remaining variables from the system after removing those equations will factor according to the DAG with the edges removed. There are some notational differences. So there's one that I think is quite important, and, and uh, given uh, the, the, the statements of uh, Judea's statements about algebra, I think this is quite interesting. But if we go back here, if we look at the, how the structural equation models are usually written, so here we have the observed, uh, observed system, and here is the experimental system, there's something which immediately strikes you as slightly strange about this, which is that this Y here is not the same as the Y over here. This is the Y that you get when you're, f uh, when you're forced to have X equals zero. If, if you were somebody that didn't have X equals zero, then your Y here might be different from this Y. Okay, so these two systems are using the same, same uh, uh, letter for two different quantities. Okay. And the same thing arises here when we look at the graphs. Okay, so we've got this Y and this Y in general are different. So, and, and also making those two things, that sort of uh, making, having the, not making that distinction is also eliding the key distinction on which the whole counterfactual setup was based. The whole counterfactual setup was based on the distinction between y of x, the outcome in the experimental worlds, and y, the outcome in the observational world. Okay? If I just use y to mean both of these, suddenly I've, it's much harder to communicate with people that are using, uh, using counterfactuals. Okay? Of course, people that use structural equations and graphs, as long as they show you the whole graph or show you the whole structural equation, they can work out which, 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 which is being referred to because it's clear in context. Okay? <coughs> but it does lead to some, uh, some it does make uh, com communication harder, I think, it, uh, and it also, it also can lead to, we also lose the ability to say when two variables really are the same. Okay? For example, the covariate L is the same both in the inter interventional world and the observational world if we're inter only intervening on X. So there's a simple fix to this, sort of almost, uh, it, it's extremely obvious and in, indeed I've, you know, I've seen Imbens uh, advocating this, but instead of writing the structural equations in this form, we should just write them in this form. We should write the structural equations describing each structural equation explicitly as, as expressing a potential outcome. And then we can take this as primitive, and then we can go back to our observed data in the, uh, in the standard way. And in this way, uh, this way we, uh, we, we don't have to elide that. It's unnecessary for, it, for us to, uh, to, to um, use the same letter for two different things. OK, a second issue that arises, difference here, is that the non-parametric structural equation model with independent areas uh, is making is making the, these assumptions. It's assuming that all of the X counterfactuals are independent of all of the Y counterfactuals. And we're assuming these sets are independent. And parts of this assumption are not testable via any randomized experiment on the variables in the system. And further, these assumptions lead to additional identification results. Okay. So I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but this is something that to, to a statistician seems concerning. So going back to the way that the fix that I just described, the way we can rewrite our, our uh, if we rewrite our structural equations like this, a natural question to say is, well, could I also, f we saw that, the, that we had the same problem in the graph, could we fix the graph? And the answer to that is yes. We can, we can fix the graph by, by making our graph describe the world where we do all of our interventions. And, and 
basically, we end up with a graph where we have potential outcomes on the graph. And, the, and we, there's a very simple and natural factorization associated with that graph that's basically identical to the factorization you would expect from a graph. And it's related back to the original uh, factorization for the observed world. And we can then apply these separations to read off independence from this graph. So here, for example, now I can read off uh, conditional ignorability. If this is my DAG, I can construct this graph and I can see x and y of x are independent given L, so I can read this off directly, okay, which is, means I can communicate with someone who thinks in terms of, of uh, conditional ignorability. And we, can, and we can also read off here that, that uh, conditional ignorability applies here and it applies here. And crucially, we can also read that it doesn't apply here. And this is the reason why uh, graphs are absolutely essential because uh, this is a circumstance which, which people think about it in the abstract. It's hard to think about uh, large sets of distributions and independence abstractly. Did not, uh, you can read statements both in econometrics books and, and uh, from Rubin where they say that this cannot arise, the circumstance where we have ignorability but we don't have conditional ignorability. And we can see just it's an immediate derivation from the graph to see that that can happen. There's another advantage to doing things in this way, which is that we can avoid talking about intervening on L. Okay, so one of the things that was said in the previous talk was structural equation model gets you all of the counterfactuals, by which the statement was meant you can intervene on everything. The, the, the set of structural equations will let you cross out anything you want. You can intervene on anything. And sometimes that might be more counterfactuals, more potential outcomes than you want. For example, suppose that L here is, is socioeconomic status. What does it mean to intervene on socioeconomic status? Does it mean that I'm going to take somebody who's a janitor and say, tomorrow you're a neurosurgeon? I mean, what is the intervention that we're doing that's going to change somebody's socioeconomic status? Substantive researchers will strongly resist any approach that requires them to go through and say that they can uh, define an intervention on every single variable because they will feel that it means that they're starting to be asked to talk about things that they don't think are well defined. And moreover, it's not necessary. The independence assumptions we needed to, in order to apply the backdoor formula here didn't talk about counterfactuals intervening on L, so why are we even having to get into a discussion about this? Much easier to just say, look, I'm going to consider a model where I don't, don't have to talk about intervening on L. I'm just going to talk about intervening on X. Okay? And the, 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 the uh, kind of graph that I've displayed here, over here on the right, single world intervention graph, allows, allows a restriction on the set of variables on which we intervene. Here's another example, uh, uh, again, to show that, uh, why substantive researchers resist talking about intervening on everything. Suppose I have this set up, X is a random prompt on a telephone survey, whether you get read one paragraph or another paragraph. Q is your response to the first survey question. R is the subject's response to the second survey question. The potential outcomes Q of X and R of X are entirely meaningful. That's how you respond based on whether you get read the first paragraph or the second paragraph. What about R of X Q? What about R of X Q? Oh, that's, that's your outcome if we read you one of the paragraphs and then intervened on your brain to make you respond in a certain way to the, uh, to the first question. Okay? I mean, maybe that I, I know that people now do apply electromagnetic fields to parts of people's brain and get them to come out with certain responses, but I still don't think the science is quite at the point where we can make someone come out with a particular response. Okay, so basically the setup I've given uh, the, 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 the unification I'm providing is trying to eliminate what I saw, what I saw previously as a false trichotomy. So people, causal modelers were sort of given three options. They could use graphs and not counterfactuals, which is an approach that, for example, Phil David and people in his school have uh, advocated. Or they could use counterfactuals and not graphs, which is an approach that many statisticians have taken. Or they could use both, but then the, the only way to use both was to uh, was via non-parametric structural equation models with independent areas, which then meant you were having to start making uh, assumptions that were not experimentally testable and also are not necessary for most identification results that people care about. And also it requires that all variables can be intervened on. Th these graphs that I've shown you here, which are, as you can see, are just a slight modification of the previously used graphs and also can still be used, you can still apply deseparation to them. They, uh, they um, finesse these problems, 
and they, they're associated with a, with a well-known uh, prior counterfactual model, the, the easy-to-pronounce, easy to finest fully randomized causally interpretable structured tree grass, or <laughs> FFRCISTGs of Robbins 1986. Okay, um, so I'm out of time, so I'll give my last summary slide. Potential outcomes represent the most general framework for reasoning about causality. Non-parametric structural equation model is a special case for counterfactual model in which we can intervene on every variable. Non-parametric structural equation model with independent errors further assumes cross-world independence relations that are experimentally untestable and lead to novel identification results. Graphs are a powerful, essential tool for reasoning about joint distributions. And SWIGs, which, uh, as I've shown, are a slight improvement on things that have been done previously, provide a simple way to connect potential outcomes with uh, outcome models and graphs without the restrictions associated with the, uh, the non-parametric structural equation model with independent areas. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you uh, said you didn't have time to uh, scale this up to big data, so now you have like three minutes to do so. <laughs> Well, I mean, so, so I've seen, I, I mean, the simplest example that, that uh, instance I've seen is situations where, uh, for example, Mendelian randomization is a context where, where I've seen people a, a, a attempt to a take the IV analysis that I showed and apply it across many, many, um, uh, many variables. Um, uh, the problem that I've worked on a lot is the problem where I have a set of variables and I'm now trying to work out what is the appropriate causal model. So a problem harder than anything that was described here where I give you some uh, observational data, I make an assumption like faithfulness, and then I then attempt to work out what the, what the structure is. And um, I have algorithms that, uh, that, that work for that, not for the gigantic uh, kind of data that uh, Mike was talking about, but it will scale to you know, 100, 200 variables. Um, I have been focused on trying to extract as much information as possible to sort of basically get to the bottom of the identification question, how much can we learn if we, in the non-parametric context. I've been driven by the non-parametric context partly because, because uh, and this is something which I think is a warning to statisticians, that um, it's possible to have a model, counterfactual model that makes quite strong assumptions, like the NPSEM IE, makes quite strong assumptions but still leads to a saturated or non-parametric model for the, for the observed data. So for, uh, I've seen papers where people go to great lengths to make the model for the observables uh, saturated. They use all kinds of non-parametric procedures to ensure that, but at the same time, they're imposing untestable assumptions uh, in the counterfactual uh, model. And that seems to me to be backwards, because basically, if I make assumptions on the observables and they're wrong, then I might need a huge amount of data to find out, but at least in, in the end, I will find out. Whereas if I make assumptions on the counterfactual distribution, it might be in principle impossible to find out. So three types of causal model. I had three types of causal model, which was potential outcomes. Uh, how does the, how do we say, say, say? So if I have potential outcomes, so I've shown you that I can relate one to the other. So if I have a graph, I can then turn the graph into a potential outcome model. So the, 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 yeah, so the, the, so essentially I have a set of one step ahead counterfactuals. For each variable I have a one step ahead counterfactual, which you can think of as intervening on everything prior to that particular uh, variable. Okay? And then I can then build up my, uh, I can then build up my graph from the potential outcomes by uh, making parents those things that, that show up as, as uh, that are non-trivial functions 
in the uh, non-trivial arguments in the potential outcome. Okay. Yes. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I got it. Right. The main doors are over there. I believe that the uh, 